last, <clears throat> the last few weeks, we've been talking about behind the scenes kind of stuff, um, going behind the scenes of Christmas and looking at situations and things and people that we don't normally look at. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to give you a little preview of Christmas Eve, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to kind of whet your appetite and say that Christmas Eve is not going to be the normal look at the manger scene because we're not going to look at the Gospels. We're going to look at a depiction of the manger scene out of Revelation, which is much, much different than the picture we get here in Luke. But today, I'm, just, I'm not going to talk very long. Just, just I want to talk about, I want to talk about the, the Magi. Because in the cantata, it says that for 400 years, there was nothing but silence. Now, earlier in the year, we've, the theme for this year was last day's living. And we kind of, we started the year off. And <laughs> put your thinking up on it. It's been a year ago. We went through a series um, through the, the book of Daniel in, in the first series called Living in Babylon. And we, we talked about how the magi of the manger scene um, were not there right when Christ was born. As a matter of fact, it was anywhere between huh, six months to two years after Christ was born. And that these magi came looking because they saw a star in the heavens. They saw a sign in the heavens and, and we talked about how these magi were, were not just counselors and, 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 and nobles and people who were in, like, you know, king's courts and everything. These guys were probably taught by Daniel. They, they had passed down what's, what, what I call the school of the prophets, started with, with Samuel way back when, and it passed down through to Daniel. Daniel continued the school of prophets, taught the truth of the scriptures to these guys, and these guys knew the signs to look for in the heavens. They knew what they were looking for. They, 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 they saw the star in the heavens, and they're like, oh, the king of the Jews, Daniel told us about this. And they go off looking for this king of the Jews, we usually attribute the magi, the wise men, I call them wise guys, we usually say there's three of them, there's always in every manger scene ever, there, there's, there's, there's three magi, but the truth of the matter is, is that we attribute three because that's how many gifts they brought, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, when in actuality, what we're going to I'm going to take just a minute to look at the sheer amount of gold, frankincense, and myrrh that they brought would have needed an entire troop and security. It was no small outing. It was not just three guys wandering in the wilderness and the desert going, oh, we're going to go see the king of the Jews. No, this was a major outing, and, and there are estimates of upwards of 40 to 50 people in this troop. We don't know. But, but in a troop this size, in, a, in an outing like this, it would have not been uncommon for them to have 50 people with them. Well, the Magi get to the scene and they go to Jerusalem because where, 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 where's, the king of the Jew? where's the king of the Jews? In Jerusalem. Well, the problem is, is that the, you ready for this one? The scholars didn't know where the Messiah was to be born. They had no clue. They had to go search the scriptures. It's right here in, in Matthew 2. Verse 4 says, Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. This is Herod. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And they had to go search this out, right? So they went there, and, and, and Herod goes back to the Magi and tells them, to go searching for him, and when you've found him, come and let me know so that I can worship him too. 
uh huh, with your sword. Because that's inevitably what happened. The Magi go and they take their gifts to the manger scene, to the Christ child. And being warned in a dream by God, they go back to their homeland by a different route. They don't go back to Herod. God says, nope, don't do it. So what Herod does is that when he realizes the Magi have duped him, he goes and makes a decree that all male children two years old and under are to be killed. I want you to stop and think of the sacrifice that Israel made for the Christ child right there. That's a huge sacrifice. There are estimates when you do research on the subject that were around 140,000 Babies, male baby boys killed during that time, 140,000. And for a long time, I wondered in Revelation, talks about 144,000 guys. Ruth came up with something and showed it and brought it to me. And when, I, when she told me this, I'm like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. It's a really good possibility that the 144,000 in Revelation are the 140,000 innocent baby boys who were sacrificed for the Messiah. Never put that together until then, until she showed that to me. I was like, oh my gosh, that is like so, that just, it just, it just, that would not surprise me (laughs) at all. The gifts that the Magi brought were gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And, and when you go to bring gifts to a king, these are standard gifts that you would bring to him. You'd bring gold, you'd bring frankincense, you'd bring myrrh. Gold signifies kingship, okay? Kings have gold. <laughs> Kings have wealth, okay? Um, the Queen of England has the wealth of the nation of, of, of England. They, they are... They are you know, she has the family inherited wealth. They are very, very wealthy. When she passes, it will pass to the next king in line, King Charles. It's just who it passes to. It's how this thing works. It will then go to William after him. And then I believe George is the oldest boy of, of William after that. The, the fortune passes from, from king to queen or whoever is in line. Gold is a standard gift to be brought to a king. Frankincense is to signify a priestly role because in, 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 in well, not in our country, but in, in, in a, a monarchy, the, the, the king has kind of a priestly role. It, it, it Christ is no different because Christ had a priestly role here. Christ had a role of a priest, a, a high priest, even though he was not of the tribe of Levi. Frankincense symbolizes the presence of the Holy Spirit because it, it, when you look through and go back through the law, the, the Holy Spirit was signified uh, through the burning of incense. Before you, those of you in the Bible study, we talk about in the tabernacle, this altar of incense right before the veil that covers the holy of holies this altar of incense it is it is two things it's twofold number one is the prayers of the faithful ascending to god number two it signifies the presence of the holy spirit okay frankincense by the way is not cheap (laughs) it is very expensive like whoa expensive there are health benefits to frankincense. It, in that day, it was found to ease stress. It can lower your heart rate, your blood pressure. It can boost your immunity. Don't be taking frankincense to boost your immunity. Don't do it. <laughs> and it can also be used as a pain reliever. <laughs> Jerry's like, yes, yes, man. <laughs> Myrrh 
is probably one of the most famous things because we understand that myrrh is a burial spice, right? Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, when Christ was crucified, bring 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. That is a lot. <laughs> and that is expensive as well. Myrrh is not cheap either. Myrrh is a fragrance. It's also used as a flavoring. It is an antiseptic, and it helps stop bleeding, believe it or not. See, the gifts the Magi brought, unknowingly on their part or knowingly, I kind of tend to think it was probably unknowingly. But the gifts that the Magi brought were very practical for what was going to happen because shortly after the Magi visit, Joseph has a dream and sees an angel and they tell him to flee to Egypt. What do you think financed that trip? The gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. God provided a trip to Egypt and back. God is absolutely, positively amazing. And when God does something, there are always multiple purposes to why he does things. It's never just one layer. Never. God has so many different things that he is accomplishing when one thing happens. For one person, a situation is nothing more than, than a difficulty and a trial, but for another, somebody learned something through it. There's a story of a, an older lady who was um, in the hospital. Um, I, I remember going to see her. Um, this was, I think it was back in Indiana. But she, I went to see her up in the hospital. She had been in the hospital for such a long time. Um, she was not able to get up, not able to do this. And I, wa I remember walking in to see her. And she looked at me. And she goes, I just don't know why I'm here still. I'm not doing any good. People have to wait on me hand and foot. They have to take care of me. They have to feed me, clothe me, bathe me, change me. Why does God still have? But, you know, I really, I can't answer that. I don't know. But I remember walking out of that room and one of the nurses had overheard that and she goes, you have no idea the testimony that she gives off every single day to us. I said, tell her that. Tell her that. She needs to hear it. It doesn't matter what you think God isn't doing because there's a lot of times we just do not see what God is doing through us in times we are just going what in the world are you doing have faith have faith and continue to live the life walking according to the spirit because you don't know who's watching you. You don't know who's listening. You don't know who needs to hear exactly what it is that you've got to say. I don't know. I can't say that there, there's a rhyme and a reason for anything that happens, really. I don't know. But that's what I do know, is that God uses all things. As you celebrate this Christmas season, it's been the most unchristmassy Christmas season like ever. I, mean, I was really in the mood for Christmas this year. It's just I don't know whether it was like it's too warm or I I, I don't know. It just <laughs> I mean I like warm, but whew, it finally got cold. But and it just it's just like I'm not Christmassy. Um, but I urge you to reflect this week as, as Christmas does come up upon us and um, reflect on your faith and, and where you've been this year and the past few years and, and, and where are you going? Um, is there a goal in mind? And, and what, what is God doing? Um, if you're not sure, 
Welcome to the club. I don't know. You know, we walk this walk one day at a time, and that's all we can do.